Hello from the Higginbottoms. H I G G I N B O T T O M. Hi, we're doing really, really well in Higginbottom household. We're enjoying the lovely weather, playing lots of badminton in the garden, plenty of walks to keep us fit. Um, but we're really missing our family at Crofton Baptist Church, and we hope it won't be very long until we come back and see you all. God bless. Goodbye. Bye. Good morning and a very warm welcome to you from wherever you join us today. It's great to have you with us to worship, to saturate ourselves in God's word and to, to seek him in prayer. A little later on now, Pastor Adrian will be bringing God's word to us and he will be reflecting on the question of where is God in a time of crisis. He will also be uh, leading us in communion this morning so do please prepare yourselves for that and feel free to join in with that act of remembrance as we are reminded of what God has done in his son Jesus Christ through his death and resurrection and of course we are reminded that even though we cannot be with friends or family nonetheless the Lord Jesus is with us he never leaves us nor forsakes us. Nevertheless, if you are craving some form of human interaction, then uh, do please join us uh, uh, for our coffee morning. If you're watching this on Sunday morning, then our coffee morning is at half past 11. Do please join us for that. Flick on your, uh, your kettle at 25 past 11 and join us at half past to share with other people in the fellowship, uh, to talk with them, have conversations. It'd be good to have you with us. It'll also be good to have you with us uh, at eight o'clock on Sunday evenings when we have our prayer meeting on Zoom as well. Um, and the details of our eight o'clock prayer meeting and our coffee morning over Zoom are in the Crofton newsletter. Let me begin this morning by bringing you the words of Psalm 46. This is a psalm which inspired uh, the great reformer Martin Luther. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with, with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. As I said, those are words which inspired Martin Luther as he penned the words of our first song this morning. A mighty fortress is our God. Our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, He amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel. On earth is not his equal Did we in our own strength confide Our striving would be losing Were not the right man on our side The 
something we can hold on to remind ourselves of even in these times and indeed in any time of crisis. We also have the tremendous privilege of being able to come to God our refuge in prayer so let us do that now. Keep us good Lord under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful and lift up all who are brought low we may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, you taught us to love our neighbour and to care for those in need as if we were caring for you. In this time of anxiety, give us strength to comfort the fearful, to tend the sick and to assure the isolated of our love and your love for your name's sake. We wish to thank you all those in the emergency services, those who may be risking their own health to keep us safe, those overwhelmed and exhausted by the demands placed upon them. We pray for those returning to work, for children returning to school, and for business owners as they get their businesses up and running again. 
Lord, give them encouragement, energy and wisdom. We also pray for wisdom and clarity for those making key decisions. For scientists, medical experts, politicians and public health officials. We pray for acts of kindness to spread in every community. Enable us to be quick to see need and respond in gracious and loving ways. Take us through this time of trial, we pray. And as people in the US and around the world protest in demand for justice, we ask, Lord, for your mercy. In your mercy, we pray that you will humble the proud, set free the captive and oppressed, and give us all courage to speak out when we see injustice. For global leaders and for ourselves, we ask for your Holy Spirit to equip us to be people who act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. Instill in our shaken souls the belief and hope that all things are possible with your creative love for strangers to become friends, for science to source to solutions, for resources to be generously shared so everyone everywhere may have what they need. For your perfect love that knows no borders may cast any fear and selfishness that divides. May your love that never ends be our comfort, strength and guide for the well-being of all and the glory of God. Amen. It's at times like these where we are reminded that we depend so much upon the grace of God. His grace is sufficient for us. Let's sing now a song which our band has, uh, has done for us this, this morning. By grace alone, somehow I stand. By grace alone, somehow I stand Where even angels fail to dream Invited by redeeming love Before the throne of God above Into his everlasting arms When condemnation grips my heart And Satan tempts me to despair I hear the voice that scatters fear The great I am the Lord is here. Oh, praise the one who fights for me and shields my soul eternally. Boldly I approach your throne, blameless now. i 
Hello, we are the Candays and we've been asked to do the reading, but before we do this, we'll give you an update of how our lockdown has been going. Uh, both Flori and I have been very busy with work at home, it's working out all right for us, and the girls have been um, studying uh, quite hard, I would say, <laughs> at least I think so, and um, we're getting the minor pleasures of the little freedom. We can go out at least a lot more, play a little bit of tennis. And yes, it's um, enjoy the good weather. Uh, I've really enjoyed not having to wake up early to go to school. Um, I've missed seeing my friends, but I've really enjoyed being able to study whenever I want to, instead of having to follow a timetable. Yeah, and I've, I've actually surprisingly enjoyed the slowdown. I've enjoyed spending time with the family and scheduling my work and being able to fit in, you know, some leisure activities as well during the day. Our reading today, we've got a couple of readings. I'll do the first bits and we'll hand over to um, the other team. Yes, it is Exodus 3, verses 7 to 9, followed by Isaiah 52, verses 1 to 6, and then... John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14. So, reading from Exodus 3, verse 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. And now Isaiah 52, verses 1 through to 6. Awake, awake, O Zion. Clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor. O Jerusalem, the holy city, the uncircumcised and defiled will not enter you again. Shake off your dust, rise up, sit enthroned, O Jerusalem, free yourself from the chains on your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For this is what the Lord says, you were sold for nothing, 
and without money you will be redeemed. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. At first my people went down to Egypt to live. Lately Assyria has oppressed them. And now what do I have here, declares the Lord. For my people have been taken away for nothing, and those who rule them mock, declares the Lord. And all day long my name is constantly blasphemed. Therefore my people will know my name. Therefore in that day they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. Next is John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And finally, John chapter 1 verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth.
Good morning. It's good to be back with you again today from a different but very familiar place. For me, there's a real mixture of emotions as I sit in front of our communion table today, because this is something that we usually do when we are together. And today, I sit here on my own. It's a special place for us, isn't it, where we get to glimpse Again, the depth of God's great love for us and these precious symbols of bread and wine. This is a place of remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me, said Jesus. This place that gathers us around the cross of Jesus Christ and draws us back to the very foundation stone of the Christian faith. Of course, one of the many things that has changed in recent months is that we are unable to do this together. So this morning, I want to encourage you to join me virtually. Perhaps you might even like to find some bread and wine or an alternative and, and join me in a little bit later on. We're living in strange times, aren't we? The majority of us, we've never been through anything like this in our lifetime before. Some of our older members no doubt will remember the impact of the Second World War, but, but on this occasion we are battling against an invisible enemy. Never before have we experienced the lockdown of cities and, and even countries, the closing of borders, banning of travel, the shutting of all but essential services, the banning of large sports gatherings, the silent tax towns and, and cities, the self-isolation and the social distancing that we're likely to have to live with for some time to come. Two weeks ago, I was at a hospital appointment up at Guy's Hospital in London. After I'd been seen, I went for a walk by the river, and it was as if the whole city was resting. It was an eerie and, and an experience which is difficult to describe. There wasn't one boat on the river, and there wasn't one plane in the sky something I suspect I will remember for the rest of my life. As we come to the cross this morning with these emblems of bread and wine in front of us, the question that I want us to reflect on together is this. Where is God at times like this? As we begin to re-emerge from lockdown and, and come to terms with some of the associated risks of living in a COVID-19 world, where is God? Maybe that's a question you've been asked by someone who, who knows that you're Christian. Maybe it's a question that you've struggled to articulate an answer for. With churches closed up and down the country, what, what message are we giving about God to those around us at a time like this? You see, when life seems predictable and, and under control and and we feel everything's okay, some of these bigger questions, well, they don't seem quite so important, but, but faced with the impact of the coronavirus and the devastating impact it has left us with, it forces us face on to consider this question of, of suffering and pain. As I write and record this week, the, the total number of deaths from this pandemic worldwide stands at around 371,000, with over 6 million people having been infected. And here in the UK, the death toll is about to pass the 40,000 mark. At times like this, we need to come back to the Bible, to reflect biblically, to remind ourselves again of who God is and, and how God is in this world that he has created. And I want to draw you very gently and pastorally back to some of the Bible passages that we had read to us a few moments ago and to, and to show you how our faith in God can help us to navigate our way through this crisis that we're experiencing together. And as we do that, I want to encourage you to keep these symbols of bread and wine uh, in your minds. Firstly, as we, as we hold these emblems, 
in front of us, I want to remind you that God knows and cares about our circumstances. And we're going to see that in Exodus chapter 3 in a few moments. Maybe you need to hear that again this morning. Maybe you need to hear that God knows and cares about your circumstances. See, this crisis has affected every single one of us and in a myriad of different ways. This crisis is much greater than just COVID-19 itself, devastating though its, its impact has been. This crisis has fundamentally changed the way we live. It's changed the way we interact with one another. It's changed the way we go about our daily lives. It, it's changed the way we commute and, and our gradual return to work as, as some children begin to return to school and various shops and businesses begin to reopen. We are doing things very differently. For others, it will lead to a loss of employment, the accumulation of debt, increase of alcohol abuse, the rise of domestic violence, the impact on mental health, the prospect of an economic recession, and the list seems to go on and on. So this morning, as we hold these emblems of bread and wine in front of us, I want to remind you that God both knows and cares about our circumstances. And why do I say that? I say that because we have God's word to shape our thinking. It is here that God reveals to us who he is and what he is like. The Bible's been described in many different ways. One of the ways that I love the Bible being described is as if it is God's love letter to us. And the story of the Old Testament is one where God begins to gather a people to himself with a, a wonderful promise made to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12 that through him and his descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ today, then you are part of the fulfillment of that great promise and the lovely refrain that runs through the Bible from beginning to end like a golden thread that says this, I will be their God and they will be my people. Which brings us to these lovely verses in Exodus that we had read for us. Verses that remind us that God both knows and cares about our circumstances. And that includes you and me. And in particular, I want you to notice the words that I have underlined as I reread these verses because they reveal to us something of the character of God. Read from Exodus chapter 3. Then the Lord told Moses, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt and into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. My friends, here is the God who stands outside of time, and yet is the same God who is closest, closer rather than our breath, who wades through the mess of this broken and fallen world of ours and comes to meet us in the middle of our mess. I found these words in Exodus 3 profoundly helpful as I reflected on my own personal journey through these challenging and uncertain days. We have a God who knows and cares about our circumstances. Did you notice the words that were underlined? Did you notice what they teach us about the character of God? God observes our misery. God hears our cries. God knows our sufferings. God comes down to deliver. God brings us to a new place. You see, God is not some kind of commander of mankind who is disconnected from his people. He is not a God who is unaffected by the pain and the circumstances of human beings like you and me. He is the God of feeling. And he is intimately and emotionally connected to you and me. And he is deeply concerned and engaged in the affairs of those who have been created in his image. 
And that is why it is so important that we allow God's word to shape our thinking, especially at times like this. The whole of the Bible story is about God seeking to communicate these deep truths about his love and his concern for people like you and me. But there's something even deeper here that I want us to grasp this morning through these symbols of bread and wine, because not only does God know and care about our circumstances, I want you to notice from our second reading this morning that it is God himself who enters into the pain of our circumstances. And we're going to see that in Isaiah chapter 53. These are great prophetic verses that point us forward in great detail to the death of Jesus Christ. One of the titles associated with, with the coming of Jesus was the term, the suffering servant. That the Messiah, the Savior, the, the rescuer of the world is described here in verse 3 as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In the words of the Passion Translation, a man of deep sorrows who was no stranger to suffering and grief. I don't know about you, but when I'm going through a difficult time, I am most at home with someone who know who's been through something similar. They get it. They, they know what it feels like, especially when we run out of words. There is an understanding, there is a, a pathos, we might say, an empathy. And it's certainly something that I've really appreciated following my own surgery and Others, at other significant times in my life, and it makes all the difference. And at the heart of the Christian faith, there is a God who knows what it is to suffer. Jesus himself ended his days nailed to a cross, abandoned by his closest friends. But there is something even more profound here in these verses in Isaiah chapter 53, and it comes in verse 4. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. God enters right into the pain of our circumstances. And I want you to grasp this as in some way our pain becomes his pain. Our sorrows become his sorrows. He may not take that pain away, but, but he will share it with you in the same way that a loving parent might absorb the pain of a child. And he will help you to navigate your way through whatever this coronavirus may have landed on your life. I remind of those lovely words in Isaiah 43 that says this to us, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've, I've called you by name in your mind. When you go through the rivers, I will be with you. Speaking of the affliction of his own people, Isaiah writes of this of God just a few chapters later. In all of their affliction, he, God, was afflicted. My friends, the God whom we worship is deeply impacted by the pain of this fallen world. He is deeply impacted by the pain and the rebellion of those he created in his own image. And yet at the same time loves us so much that he was willing to enter right into this world of ours in the person of Jesus Christ. Whatever you and I may be facing this morning, God both knows about it, cares about it, and feels it. Whatever crisis and pain you may be going through, God both knows and shares in that pain that you are facing. Your pain becomes his pain. We come to someone who knows what it feels like. We come to someone who cares for us, passionately we come to someone who gets it because he has been there he took our pain and bore our suffering writes isaiah as he points through the pages of the old testament and to jesus as god himself steps into his own world to become one of us or in the verses that we read a little bit earlier on in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, writes John. My friends, we come to a God who enters 
right into our humanity and shows us how to be fully human. Tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet was without sin. The one who wept at the death of his friends. The one who asked for a drink on a thirsty day at the well of a Samaritan woman. The one who grew tired and needed to rest. The one who was deserted by his closest friends. The one who was ridiculed by the masses and misunderstood and falsely accused. The one who experienced the same range of human emotions that we do. And ultimately, when nailed to a cross, his side was pierced and blood and water came spilling out. Because Isaiah reminds us so powerfully, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. At this time of crisis, when we may well be tempted to ask the question, where is God? Here is the answer. He is here. He is alongside us. He is with us. He has stepped into the humanity of our world as our pain becomes his pain and our sorrows become his sorrows. And whatever fears and anxieties you and I may be facing right now, God wants us to know that through his word, that he knows and he cares and he feels it because he has been there too. And finally, as we hold these emblems of bread and wine in front of us and make our way to the cross, I want to remind you again that God suffers not just with us, but for us. Each one of us will have our own personal stories at this time and our own personal experiences of this crisis. And each of those stories will be entirely different. And perhaps you may be thinking to yourself the story, my story is beyond fixing. Christian faith says that the way to fix a broken story is to place it into the much bigger story of God, where one day death and evil and disease will be defeated forever which brings us gently this morning to the foot of the cross. It's the place where God has promised. It's the place where God has demonstrated that one day he's going to put everything right again. And he has proved that by raising Jesus from the dead. We come again this morning to the place where we get to see just how much you and I are loved by God. Or in the words of John, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ lay down his life for us. Where is God at times like this? He's to be found here, nailed to a wooden cross in the person of Jesus Christ. He's to be found here at the cross, being abandoned by God, so you and I need not be. He is to be found here crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is to be found here paying the price for our sin and our rebellion so that we can be reconciled to the living God. And so as we take bread and wine together in a few moments, let me remind you of how Peter, that much loved disciple of Jesus, describes this experience of of living faith in the risen Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and his great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. New birth into a living hope. Same hope that we've been unpacking over these recent Sunday mornings together, that through the death and resurrection of Jesus, the new has come and the old has gone. That in Jesus, God has began, begun to fulfill that great promise of new creation. The beginning of God's will being done on earth as Jesus taught us to pray. And in, the words, and in words of extraordinary tenderness, at the end of the Bible, we read of God's plan for a time when there will be no more death. And no more mourning or crying or pain because the old order of things will have passed away and we're told that God will wipe 
away every tear from our eyes. And one day, Jesus will return as God's space, the space we call heaven, and our space, this space we call earth, will once again be joined together for all eternity in God's new creation. Which is why Jesus took bread and wine and said to his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. Here is a way in which I want you to remember me. Where is God at times like this? Where is the Graham Kendrick song? This is our God. Here is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. The God who knows and cares about our circumstances. God who suffers not just with us, but for us. The God who enters right into our pain and our circumstances of the person of Jesus Christ. So as we come to the cross this morning, as we take these precious symbols of bread and wine, I want to invite you to pause with me and to reflect on the words of a song that that takes us through some of the things that we've been thinking about this morning and prepares us to take bread and wine together. None of my pain has ever caught you by surprise Still it's hard to trust you when I'm lost in the wondering why But I'll trade every question just to lay down a rest in your heart And I'll reach for your hand though you led me here into the dark And now If it's random or providence, neither are a comfort to me. Are you cruel if you planned it, or weak if you allowed it to be? Half of me is still believing, the other half is angry and confused. Oh, but all of me is desperate. Cause a reason can't wipe away tears No, I don't need all the answers Just be here beside me Come be here beside me And I won't ask you for reasons Cause a reason can't wipe
want to invite you to pause with me as we come to communion this morning, as we bring our confession to God. Do join me in these words which will appear on the screen. Almighty God, long-suffering and of great goodness, we confess to you. We confess with our whole hearts our neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, our wrongdoing, thinking and speaking. We confess the hurts we have done to others and the good we have left undone. O oh God, forgive us, for we have sinned against you and raise us to newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And this lovely invitation that we often use when we come to communion. Come to this table not because you must, but because you may. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but come because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and you would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. Apostle Paul tells us of the instructions which Jesus gave for taking bread and wine in this way. He writes, for the tradition which I handed on to you came to me from the Lord himself. That on the night of his arrest, the Lord Jesus took bread and after giving thanks to God, broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. You proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes, until he returns. And so my friends, we have the opportunity this morning to take bread. We take bread, we, we break it. Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The end of the supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this is the new covenant which is sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink this, you do this in memory of me. So the invitation this morning is to take bread and to take wine and, and to remember that Jesus died for you and to feed on him with thanksgiving in your heart. Let's do that together this morning. Your death, O Lord, we commemorate. Your resurrection, Lord, we confess. Your final coming, we await. Glory be to you, O Christ. And we say together, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Let's take some moments to pray together. Father, this communion table, we are given a foretaste or a glimpse of eternal things. 
When we think of that picture of worship given to us through John's incredible vision of heaven in the book of Revelation, of a multitude that, that no one could count from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in worship in front of the risen Christ. But in the context of that powerful vision of unity, we think of the protests and some of the violent responses that are seeping, uh, sweeping across the US following the cruel and untimely death of George Floyd. We pray for peace, but more than that, we pray for the dignity and the value and the mutual respect of all people and for all for whom Christ died. That men and women might be reconciled, not just to one another, but also to the living God. We pray for the equality of all people, regardless of color or race, background or culture, praying that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray for our own church family at this time, unable to meet together, unable to meet physically around this communion table. Help us to love and to care for one another well in these challenging days. Protect our togetherness and our unity, we pray, so that through our love for one another, those around us will see something of Jesus Christ in us. And we pray especially for those who are in hospital at this time, for Alice Simmons and Alice Jones and Ralph Turner. May they know your peace, your presence, your comfort, and your healing at this difficult time. We remember Sam Ballarataram as he continues to rest at home, asking for his full recovery. And finally, we pray for all in our church family in these challenging and uncertain times, for parents and children, for those living alone, for our key workers and those on the front line, for those returning to work, for those struggling with financial difficulties and issues of employment, for marriages and relationships within the home. We bring our prayers to you, our great God, the God who is with us and the God who will not let us go. Amen. We conclude this morning. I want to just take a few moments to to say one or two things about how we should respond as Christians to this pandemic. John Lennox, in his really helpful little book entitled Where is God in a Coronavirus World, makes four very helpful and practical suggestions in his concluding chapter that I want to share with you as we conclude. Firstly, heed the advice we're being given. On a really practical level, we need to heed the best medical advice that we are being given. God expects us to use the wisdom and the resources that he has provided us with. And that includes medical care and medical advice. That means ensuring that we do all that we can to ensure that we do not spread this virus to those around us. So let's heed the advice we're being given. Secondly, maintain perspective. In this shaky and vulnerable and uncertain time, it's so easy for us to lose perspective, but we've been here before. Not in our lifetime, but history has shown us that these pandemics come and go. They are part of what it means to live in a fallen and broken world that is out of step with its creator. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us, meanwhile, we groan in the same way that all of creation groans, but but you and I are resurrection people. That means we get to enjoy the first fruits of God's new creation in the here and now. That means bringing a little bit of heaven and earth to those around us and giving the reason for the hope that we have. Thirdly, love your neighbor. These days have led to conversations with our neighbors probably in ways like never before. They brought us closer together as a nation and Jesus calls us to love our neighbors well. That means that we should be looking for ways for how we should love others, even though that may be costly to ourselves. But that's how God loves us, as we've just been thinking around the communion table. Loving our neighbors means avoiding those selfish attitudes to look after ourselves in a way that ignores the very real and practical needs of those around us. And finally, remember eternity. 
This crisis has brought us face to face with the real prospect of death. We've been reminded of the fragility of life. We've been reminded that we are not in control. We've been brought face to face, many of us, with our own insecurities. This crisis provides us with the opportunity to reflect on our future hope in a way that impacts us in the here and now. I love how C.S. Lewis highlights the importance of telling the whole story and, and in his own inimitable way he writes this, a book on suffering which says nothing about heaven or, or new creation we can add, is leaving out almost the whole of one side of the account. My friends, these days have provided us with a great opportunity to reaffirm our confidence regarding the future. Apostle Paul gives us a great summary, which I want to read as we conclude this morning. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we conclude this morning, you may well be thinking to yourself, I want to dig into this a little bit more deeply. And let me recommend John Lennox's little book, Where is God in a Coronavirus World? Or it may be that you are really struggling. Life is tough and it's all feeling too much and you'd love someone to pray with you. I'd love that opportunity. I've set Wednesday evenings aside and Friday afternoons and if you'd like to share any of those struggles, you'd like some prayer, please do contact me via the details that you'll find on our weekly news sheet and I'd love to meet with you and pray with you. And so we conclude with a song that reflects so much of what we've been looking at together this morning. May God bless you as you head out into another new week. Jesus, I'm
thank you for joining us today. And I do wish you a very good week. Please, if you have any anything that you need prayer for, do reach out to your pastoral overseer, who I'm sure will be happy to help you. And let me finish with these wonderful words of Paul from his uh, letter to the Romans. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord.